Well, welcome. Thank you all for coming. I'm really excited to see so many people here. There's a lot of excitement. Um, we had this idea to put together this workshop because we were interested in deep learning for human mathematics, and it turned out there was a lot of other people that were interested as well. So I, this, I hope, is sort of the beginning of, of a community that's going to grow. Um, uh, I want to thank the, the people that helped me organize this, um, PJ Pandy and Rap, and um, Abe from, from Adam Lays, um, and uh, Teresa and Yasna for helping with logistics. Um, just a preview of what's coming today. Um, in the morning session, we have uh, EJ and uh, Ryan. And then um, we have a small break, and then uh, Abe is giving a talk after that. And then um, in, after lunch, we have uh, Ryan and Brath are giving a talk. And then in the afternoon, we have uh, Martha Cristo and, and Magdalena. And um, I hope you can stay for all of it. If you have to come and go, that's all right. And then um, I recently, we set up a cocktail hour um, in the mud building, um, which is on the other side of the construction. So I hope you can come to that as well. OK, I'm really looking forward to it. And I'd like to introduce um, EJ Candy and accept what he has to say. Thanks. Great. Great, thank you. Yeah, the uh, the cocktail hour sounds like it's very far away. It's like 30 seconds uh, just around the, around the corner. And uh, in particular, one of the things that I am ha um, particularly pleased about schedule-wise is that we have a lot of breaks and a lot of time for people to chat. And I think that's going to be a very important part of today. And I'd love for uh, people, especially who don't know each other, to get to know each other. OK. So actually, you know, the, the title of my talk, I think, was given to me. I'm not even sure by which organizer. Um, but so I, I strive to, to uh, live up to this title. Uh, the title is, the, and actually, I slightly changed it. I turned the statement to a question. Uh, the irrational exuberance of deep learning, can the breakthroughs in imaging and natural languages be replicated in, in chemoinformatics? And this is very much on our minds. I think if you look around, especially if you live around here, you see these self-driving cars everywhere. You look at ImageNet and what people are doing with image and speech and deep learning having such a huge impact and all of that. It seems natural to think that it could have an impact here, but there are going to be huge differences between the two problems. And so the question is, what can we do? Okay, for this audience, I think it's old hat, but I think we all know about Moore's Law, but you know, I think this is something where we think about intellectually, but that you know, just wrapping our heads almost like emotionally around the fact that the cost of compute and storage and genomics and mobile and all these things are decreasing exponentially it is really, I think, hard to really fathom. And the way I think about it is that I think about just from my own personal story, when I was in grad school, um, I, I used a CM5, was, I was at MIT, it was an amazing machine. Uh, you know, 10 years, uh, but you know, we could never do any of the things that we did, let's say, with folding at home on something like this. Uh, ten years ago, Folding at Home gets a Guinness World Record for the first machine to a betaflop. Um, it was the only machine of that scale at the time. You know, it's groundbreaking. And now, just ten years after that, um, what used to be a Guinness World Record is basically $100 a day on Amazon. And so, in a sense, what Moore's Law really means, in my mind, is something that was impossible becomes, you know, groundbreaking but rare, and then becomes cheap to free. And we've seen this all over the place. Another great example is genomics. 20 years ago, the Human, human Genome Project, one <coughs> genome is $3 billion. 10 years ago, uh, uh, $3 million. Right now, $3,000 on its way to 330. OK, so what does this get us when you combine uh, cheap compute and cheap storage? Well, uh, deep learning is really emerging as a possibility now due to this. And this is from a classic paper, I think, that many of you have seen before, where uh, Jeff Dean Andrew Yang and collaborators at Google and Stanford fed YouTube through deep learning. And uh, you know, so as you feed it through, you get more complicated shapes. But the interesting thing and the exciting thing was the emergent properties come out of this, that faces came out of this. And of course, since this is YouTube, uh, the most important part of the internet came out of this, uh, of course, cats. Uh, uh, and the key thing is that they didn't have to program in the cats or the faces. These emerged naturally. And so by analogy, it's so tantalizing to think, well, maybe we could just do this for drug design. We could sort of piece out between drug-like and non-drug-like molecules. Maybe uh, here's going to be a GPCR agonist. Here's going to be a kinase inhibitor. But uh, clearly, it's one thing to put words on a slide. It's another to see to what extent this is really possible. 
And so that's the real question for today. Will these methods be successful in drug design to what degree? And uh, very much this is not gonna be yes or no, this is gonna be a quantitative answer. What's the, in a very dry sense, what's the improvement in AUC from traditional machine learning methods like random forest to, to these methods? And, and what's that impact? Okay, so for today, uh, I wanna talk about a couple different areas, time permitting. Um, I actually started putting this talk together a week ago and at first I was worried I wouldn't be able to fill up sort of 35 to 40 minutes and now I have like 100 slides. Uh, but, but so I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to uh, sort of give the highlights I think. Uh, so first off, I want to briefly talk about our work combining um, uh, machine learning with physical simulation and where machine learning can have an impact there. But then get into talking about uh, deep learning and machine learning and, and what we did for cheminformatics. Uh, then actually uh, take a brief segue into applying this uh, into real world cases where uh, members of my uh, lab, uh, Stephen Kearns and Broth, uh, Bart Ransunder, worked with uh, Vertex and Pfizer respectively on their internal data sets to see how this does. Uh, I think the highlight of today for my talk will be um, one shot learning methods which are very new. We released the uh, preprint last night. Uh, and uh, one-shot learning is taking, I think, machine learning by storm. And as you'll see, I think there's some exciting possibilities here on the small molecule side. And finally, time permitting, I think there'll be uh, limits to this uh, time-wise. I'll talk about some of the things that we've done to apply this. Okay, first, let's talk about combining machine learning and physical simulation. And so physical simulation is you know, something very dear to my heart, something that I've spent my, a lot of my career working on. This is a simulation of a GPCR. You know, it's been a fantasy for many years to be able to do physical simulation, to be able to uh, enable drug design. There's a lot of challenges, as I think everyone in this room knows, uh, but we're making real progress on them. Um, I could give a whole talk on one challenge in terms of the accuracy of force fields. I'll just mention in passing that we've had huge advances in combining machine learning with force field design. And this is the force balance project, which we've released water models. And um, I think today we're gonna submit our paper on protein force field models. That force fields have come a long way and uh, to, to high accuracy. But the, the other issue that remi remains is the long time scales. And this is something that um, uh, we've been pushing for many years and using methods like folding at home and GPUs and, and um, mathematical methods like Markov state models, we've been able to get to relatively long time scales. And so for those of you that are interested to either use the tools which are open source, um, uh, here are the, the references. It's going to go by a little fast. So if you have any questions, feel free to also email me. But so what can we do here? What can, what can uh, Dynamics show? Well, one of the things in particular that we're finding, and we see this in GPCRs, we see this in kinases, we see this in many different types of systems, is that the molecular dynamic simulations find states that are not seen before, uh, states that are not seen in crystal structures. And uh, this is data from uh, Evan Feinberg and Amir Farmi uh, in my lab. It's uh, unpublished data, but uh, I think just recently submitted. And um, here we're looking at uh, um, small molecules in GPCRs. And in particular, new states emerge, uh, either by looking at the ape, starting from APO um, structures or starting from co-crystal co structures. And here the important part is that having crystal structures are critically important, obviously, for a place to start. But being able to, but I would say that we can enhance from that in, by sampling the space more completely. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go over too much of the details other than to skip to the punchline, which is that if we compare the impact of, of just looking at the crystal structures alone and docking to them, or looking at the simulations where we've been able to sample the space more fully and then docking to those states, we can see a, a noticeable increase in AUC. Uh, this is using relatively straightforward machine learning methods like uh, random forest. Um, as we'll see, I think the idea will be is that I think we can start stacking these methods on top of each other. And, and on top of this, adding, let's say, one-shot methods to be able to push these AUCs even further. But they're starting to get the point where we're in the mid eight, uh, mid point eights, and hopefully with the stacking, we can get much farther. One final thing I'll mention just in passing is that this is also, I think, a um, appealing uh, sort of validation is too strong a word, but support of a hypothesis that these receptors explore a complicated conformational landscape and that crystal, crystal structures capture a lot of it, but that simulations can add parts that are not seen before and that have predictive value. Okay, so let me switch gears and talk about our work into deep learning. And uh, in particular, a lot of our work here is um, where the sort of machine learning applied to simulation would be useful for generating leads potentially. Uh, this is a game for very much in terms of screening or especially a lot of the work that we've done over the last few years has been in repurposing. 
I think for this audience, many people are familiar with it, but the basic idea of repurposing is that clearly drugs can have multiple functions. My favorite example is uh, um, Benadryl. You know, it's used as an antihistamine, it's also used as a sleeping pill. I always find it very amusing that in the Los Altos uh, drugstore, on one side of the aisle, it's the sleeping pill, and one side of the aisle is the antihistamine. It's the exact same drug, exact same dose, except the sleeping pill costs four times as much. Um, <laughs> I, I buy the antihistamine, um, but uh, so it's, it's clear that it's, it, things can have multiple indications. So the, the deeper question here is, can we uh, identify for a given indication of interest what existing drug might be interesting? And, uh, and here we're starting to apply and develop machine learning uh, approaches, especially deep learning approaches. <laughs> okay, well, so what's the framework for this? How could we even conceptualize the problem? Well, to conceptualize a problem, I think before applying machine learning, a natural approach here would be to take some, something simple like shape-based similarity. And so the idea of shape-based similarity, you know, simply put is that if we think we have a key, let's say a small molecule that's a lead, but it's not a drug, it's toxic uh, for some reason. Um, uh, but we want to compare it to, let's say, other keys, uh, known compounds that are known not to be toxic. We put the keys up to against each other, we see how similar they are, and that would be indication of a good drug. And uh, this is, you know, in, there are many uh, commercial tools that do this, like OpenAI Rocks, and this is actually commonly used and, and can be fairly powerful. The challenge here, though, is that if you're comparing real keys, you know, we have a sense for what similarity means. And the challenge here is, if we compare two small molecules, what does similarity mean? And in Rocks, there's a sort of force field of sorts that defines the similarity matching. What the hope is here is that machine learning can sort of come up with a better metric for similarity. And this is something that is only vaguely comes out of, I think, the first topic here, deep learning, but I think is much, much more strongly comes out in terms of the one shot that I'll talk about next. Okay, so what are the challenges? Well, first off, you know, is that um, typically our data sets are quite small and, you know, uh, even 10,000 to 30,000 compounds is still quite huge from a, a small molecule sense, but small from, let's say, a machine learning sense. Uh, typically, these uh, data sets are very imbalanced. Out of, let's say, 30,000 compounds, um, you know, there won't be many actives. And then finally, and this is really the key point, is that uh, featureization is always the challenge. Is, you know, if we can't come up with the right features, uh, ML, especially traditional ML, will fail. And so what are we going to do here? Well, um, so uh, one of the things that um, a, a paper that we published in com uh, collaboration with uh, members of the Google team, and I think uh, David, I think, is here. Um, um, uh, I think, uh, and, and, and Bart is here as well. Actually, you guys want to just wave your hands so you people know who you are. So there's David and there's, there's Bart. Um, and uh, I'll be talking about this work here. And in particular, uh, for all the machine learning work that I'll talk about from uh, my lab, this is uh, in an open source package called deepchem.io. Okay. So why did we apply deep learning? Well, um, there were really some wonderful results from the Mercagal contest that especially multitask deep networks were useful. And the idea about a multitask network, as we'll see, is that it allows us to learn uh, a lot of information and hopefully apply it to new tasks. Um, and then, you know, clearly um, other methods like vi Im images and speech were doing quite well. But there are outstanding questions at this point. You know, can we come up with the right featureizations uh, to make this work? And, uh, you know, often in deep learning, the sort of tagline, the sort of the marketing is that you don't have to featureize it because the DNN is going to featureize it for you. But that's not completely true, right? I mean, for an image, it's kind of obvious what the, the representation is. But for a small molecule, what is the representation? Uh, in the early days, we were joking that, you know, we should just be able to take like a photograph of the 2D uh, chem draw and, and, and the DNN should be able to handle that, right? Uh, but that's kind of ridiculous on many levels. It's almost like saying I want to take a photograph of a piece of text and have the DNN do OCR and NLP and on to uh, everything on top. So there still are questions of futurization, and you'll see that in this work um, we're still struggling a little bit, and I think in the one shot we make some progress. Um, and then secondly, what are the architectures that provide the best performance? So one of the key things that came out of this work is the sense of multitask learning. And so for people that are unfamiliar with multitask learning, here's the basic idea, is that often, especially in a drug design setting, we do not have a lot of data for our task of interest. Generally, we have almost no data for our task of interest. So if our task is designed a new inhibitor of a kinase that no one's ever seen before, um, there's not a lot of data for that. But there'll be data for related tasks. There'll be data for related kinases, which often have high homology. And also, there'll be data for things without hom any homology, data for GPCR inhibitors and so on. And so the appeal about multitask learning is that we can throw in a lot of data and that the system essentially learns chemistry and learns about the nature of molecules. And, and so the learning and the other tasks are still useful for the new task. 
Another part of this, which I think is extremely important, and I think is under the rug technically, but we don't spend enough time talking about, is regularization. That it's very easy to overfit, especially when you're learning and you don't know very much. And this is, a, I think, a very powerful means for regularization. If you think about it, if any of you have kids or seen kids interact with things, I, I remember uh, with my, my daughters when they were young, you know, we had a cat at home, and the first time they saw a dog, they called it a cat. And that's overfitting, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's close, you know, but I think it, this is the type of thing. If they had uh, more, more, more tasks to draw from, they might have done a better job there. Um, so, so what are the questions to address here? Well, so first off is, um, you know, do, do multi-test networks provide a benefit? So recall the historical context of this is that um, in the Mercagal context, uh, contest, DNNs did already pretty well. So that's, I think, fairly well established. The question is, can multitask do better? And second one is that, can adding more tasks uh, make it better? And then finally, can we um, extract sort of generalizable information about chemical space? And so a uh, protocol here, I think maybe in the sake of time, I won't go over too many details about the protocol. I think with all of the key authors here, um, uh, we can go into questions if people have time. And especially also, I, I should mention as a tangential point is that I would love the speakers to try to leave some time for questions so we can have a, 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 a great discussion. So maybe I'll, I'll just skip to the results. So the, there's a lot of comparisons here. There's on the top are comparisons to traditional methods like logistic regression or random forest, which are commonly used uh, in drug design settings and in, in, in industry, combined with different types of systems. So single task neural networks and multitask neural networks. And the key thing to notice here is that there is an improvement in, in AUC in these uh, different, uh, uh, different areas, whether we're talking about MOV or TOX21 and so on. So what about these questions that I ask? Like, first off, how does more data help? And so one thing that we do see is that adding more tasks does help. And I think this is something where we went up to about um, 250 tasks, and it may be starting to saturate, it may be starting to go linear. I think we need more tasks to know, but there is definitely improvement more, with more tasks. And let me skip this part. Um, and so, so the wrap up of this part here, just to summarize, is that, you know, how do we see how these things work? Well, you know, so multitask learning does seem to help. And I think this fits our intuition for how learning works. And, and, there, and it looks like there is room to grow. It wasn't like it was necessarily flattening out. It may have been going a little linear. Um, uh, and in particular, that uh, it appears that, um, you know, we, we can possibly extract simple information. That's, uh, and one of the things that we've been wanting to do is to take what we've learned from the DNNs and extract information that we can apply to simpler ML. Okay, so this was, a, uh, this was not a true prospective test. This is something where we did cross, uh, many fold cross validation and so on. You know, what happens when we apply this to, to the real world? Uh, real world, uh, as we know from the movie The Matrix, generally isn't as pretty. Uh, and so, you know, what would we see? So at this point, Stephen Kearns went to Vertex for a couple months. Um, uh, he was a grad student in my lab. He uh, worked as an intern at Google, uh, uh, collaborated on these methods, and then uh, did an internship at um, uh, Vertex. And I'll make a, a side here, a sociological side, is that I think this is also an interesting model for grad students more broadly in that Stephen, I think, got experience in many different places in a way that he wouldn't. Normally, he had an academic experience here at Stanford. He got to spend time with the Google team, and he got to spend time in pharma. And I think there's a lot of uh, information flowing in many different ways that way. And one of the take point, takeaways of my talk is that I think we will need to work closely because some of us have data, some of us are familiar with these methods, uh, some of us have infrastructure, and so on. Okay, so Stephen goes to, to Vertex. And this is a paper that we've submitted that's in the archive right now with Brian Goldman at Vertex. And basically what he's doing is he's applying the exact same methods uh, to, uh, to data inside of, of Vertex. And the reason why we had to do this is that, I, and I think for those of you in pharma will know very well, that pharma has really interesting data sets, but they're not just gonna like SCP it over here. <laughs> you know, I think uh, that's never going to happen. So it's easier for, for uh, Stephen to go behind the firewall for, them, for the data to come out. Okay, so what did we look at? So Stephen looked at a couple, uh, several different uh, ADME, ADMET uh, data sets. Um, honestly, I don't really know what these things are because uh, they are inside the firewall, so I know them by their letters. Uh, and I think that's probably fine enough. I think I, one of the downsides of this approach is that because uh, this, the data is proprietary, um, we maybe can't go into all the nuances, but this is something maybe we could do as a follow-up. But given these data sets, you know, how well do these methods do? Well, in general, um, with only a few rare exceptions, they always improve uh, the AUC from uh, sort of simpler methods like um, random forest that we're looking at here. 
And, uh, and so in a sense, we've sort of validated what we saw before, that there is a similar improvement in AUC. And if you look at the details, and I know there's a lot of numbers here, and so maybe the key numbers to be looking at are, so let's, let me walk you through this because uh, 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 there's, there's just a lot. So we have a couple different architectures uh, coming down the line. And then for these architectures, we have a median AUC. Uh, we say median because remember, we're doing lots of cross-validation, and so this is the typical AUC that we'd expect. Um, we compare the median AUC to random forest uh, or to logistic regression, and it gives you this delta AUC. And then the sign test is the sort of confidence interval that we think, uh, in a sense, the, how strong we think that this is going to be better. And in general, the bolds are cases where we have a lot of confidence that the method would be better. In general, the method is always better because you see, except for one maybe small case where it's essentially comparable. So the method is never worse, but in several cases, it's, it's clearly better. And so this is one case in terms of, uh, uh, and then let's see what I want to do here. Actually, maybe I'll skip this. So the, the take home message from this, and um, I don't know if we have anyone from Vertex here, but is that I think there was confidence that this was working. The, the issue would be, so you may ask, well, is Vertex now switching everything out from random force to DNNs? And uh, you know, there is a huge amount of infrastructure that it takes to do here. And so there's another sociological point I would make, which is that a company like Google has the infrastructure such that if they had a 0.1 increase in AUC, they would jump on that. And that's maybe worth several billion dollars, depending on the application. Um, in, in our space, uh, typically companies don't have that infrastructure. And this 0.1 increase in AUC may or may not be that much valuable. And, but these are questions that we have to do and we have to build in sociologically. Uh, as we start to increase this threshold, it's possible, you know, like 0.7 to 0.8 is not very exciting. 0.7 to 0.9, 0.7 to 0.95, uh, maybe that's where we start reaching the threshold. And it, that's where, especially in the discussion, it would be great to hear from people in the industry what they view as the thresholds of where this gets interesting. Okay, and so then Bart um, went to Pfizer virtually. In this case, uh, he didn't physically go to Pfizer. Um, we had collaborators at Pfizer, and so that's why we were sort of in the middle of the author list here, and, and they ran uh, the code. And th the target here was base one, uh, common Alzheimer's target. And the workflow is similar to what we had before. And um, again, a lot of table with numbers, so I'll, I'll try to walk you through it. But the bottom line is that we got to a very similar place. That if you look at uh, sort of the sort of usual suspects of methods that are used in, in industry, and let's say used at Pfizer, uh, and usual suspects for features like 2D fingerprints and so on, and you compare how we're doing in terms of the validation set, the AUCs on the validation set for these DNN methods are, are quite strong, let's say uh, 0.8s, uh, compared to like simpler methods, uh, which are typically 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and so on. Okay. So um, I want to only talk for 35 minutes, so I, and I want to spend most of my time on this next section. And so, um, so in terms of, I think, where we're going, uh, one-shot learning methods, I think, are particularly interesting. Uh, and uh, you know, I always, when I even first heard the term one-shot with Feifei uh, you know, years ago, uh, it immediately made me think of this scene in, in Eight Mile, where you know, you got to like, you, you got to get it right. Uh, and so, yeah, so one-shot methods have been um, very interesting for quite a while in other spaces. Uh, Feifei Li here um, had huge significant contributions to it on the image side. And you know, how does one-shot learning work? Well, there's different variants of one-shot learning. You know, some methods for one-shot learning is that you would sort of carry things over. So you carry featurizations over, you carry learning over, you carry something over. Um, the method that um, uh, Han and Bart in my lab uh, used for this is a so-called Siamese one-shot learning. And so uh, this is from an earlier work in terms of image recognition. And this is the basic idea for Siamese one-shot learning, is that we have a bunch of twins. And so the question is, can we sort of say where the two things are similar? So you, you learn on certain things and you show a picture of an elephant once, not like a thousand pictures of elephants like you typically do in DNNs, but you have like one picture of an elephant. And given one picture of an elephant, could you identify that another picture of an elephant is the same thing? And the reason why this is useful is that in these training sets I talked about for DNNs, you know, we were happy to have 50,000 compounds with 50 actives. And some of the pushback that we got from people in the industry is like, you know, by the time we have 50 actives, we don't need you guys. Um, and, and that's a fair comment. So, you know, it's um, more like, uh, you know, what if we only had one active, one lead compound or five? What could you do there? And so this is where uh, this type of approach, I think, is especially appealing because at its heart, 
This approach has deep similarities to the way we uh, sort of think about this in a lot of the non-machine learning camera informatics. So if you think about what you're doing wi when you run rocks or run your favorite shape, uh, 2D or 3D shape a comparison algorithm, what you're doing is essentially this. Uh, you're sort of doing your own Siamese learning uh, in your head. Or if you're even a, a, a medicinal chemist, what are you thinking about in your head? You have your own sense of similar or not similar that you've trained your own neural nets on. And so what I find particularly appealing about this is that I think this is sort of akin to the way that we've been doing this all along. And the, you know, the funny thing about deep learning is that in some ways deep learning is new computationally, but in a sense we've been deep learning all along where we have one neural net to feed into another and to another. It's just that the, the first neural nets was our, were our own brains and then we're feeding into to our features into higher into simpler methods. Here we're sort of trying to take us out of the system. But I, what I find appealing about this is that it's similar in spirit. Okay, so there's a couple challenges here though. So again, pictures are easy and, and I'm really jealous about people who work in, in the image space because it's obvious what the sort of data structure is. So one problem is what's the right data structure? And so one uh, solution to what's the right data structure is to do um, convolution nets on graphs. And so um, to try to sort of untangle the uh, complexity there, when people look at pictures, they use a convolutional neural network. And the reason why is that a convolutional neural network can handle translational invariance on the picture. So maybe the soccer ball's here or here or here, that shouldn't matter. So convnets naturally handle a translational uh, invariance. What convnets on graphs do is that it's essentially a generalization of this, except instead of the translational invariance of where you are in the picture, there's sort of like a graph invariance of which part of the substructure you're looking at. And if you think about what people did with simpler fingerprints, like um, uh, where you just look at substructures of 2D structures, there's essence of this that are similar, but this has the hope to generalize on top of it and learn much better. And in a sense, what I like about this is that it reminds me of what people were thinking about in the image space, and it feels like a natural way to apply it to the, uh, to the molecule space. So there's been many work here. These are, I think, two um, key papers in my mind, one from um, uh, Harvard group and, and one from the Google group uh, um, with us as well. Okay, so that's one part. So, the, so if we combine these two things, the, uh, the one-shot Siamese learning and the convnets, what do you do? What do you get? Well, um, that gets us close. And there's one other element that we're gonna have to put in, but this is a paper that we just put in the archive uh, last night. Uh, and so this is Han and, and Bart, uh, who um, waved his hand earlier, and he's in the back and one of the co-organizers. And so um, this was our approach to combine these methods. There's one last part, which Bart is gonna be giving a talk, so I will let him go into all the details, but the the key thing that's going on here is that uh, they've created an architecture that has a couple key parts. One key part is that we replace typical convolutional neural networks with graph convolution nets. And the other part, which is uh, interesting, is this concept of a residual um, a long short term memory. And I'll, I'll let Bart sort of go into all the gory details there. But the basic idea is that what we are doing, and maybe I'll put up a little math, is what we're doing here is that we are, in a sense, doing what you do with rocks in your head, but, uh, but in a computational sense, that um, we are building up a sense of similarity, and we're training on that similarity, and then we're iterating. And in doing that, um, uh, the hope is that we'll be able to compare these two keys and know what the right way to compare them are and in order to do one-shot learning. And so this involves a couple interesting tricks, and especially tricks that you normally apply to pictures like convolution and, and max pool, now become graph convolutions and graph pools. Um, and, uh, and so the, uh, so, okay, so we build up the pipeline with all these things, sort of building up similar in spirit to what people have done in images, but I think fairly significant changes in novel architecture necessary for molecules. The question is how well we do. And so um, Han and Bart looked at two different data sets, TOX21, which I think many people here in the room are familiar with. It was a perspective challenge for predicting TOX. Uh, we did not do this perspectively, although uh, now I'm curious to, to do that if they do this again. And Insider is an adverse uh, rep um, reactions uh, database. And so uh, the punchline here is that there is a significant improve improvement in AUC over random forest. So uh, if you look at random forest, um, so let's, let's take the top one, uh, TOX21. So when we go down, we're looking at less and less data. So a data set where we only have 20 points, 10 positive, 10 negative, all the way down to pretty small where you have one positive, one negative, uh, about as small as it can get. With, which, with data sets that small, it's not a surprise that random forest is basically random. Um, that is getting you know, 0 0.53, 0 0.57, and so on. Um, uh, you know, very close to 0 0.5. The intriguing thing is that even with these data sets, uh, our new method, this residual LSTM, is getting into the 0.8s. Um, 
And I think that is a pretty dramatic difference. And we see that both in terms of the Tox21 data set and the CIDR data sets. And where I think this is, so obviously this is interesting in terms of a real life application. Um, it's also interesting potentially in terms of, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, in, in terms of collaborations, because you don't have to give us these huge data sets. You know, um, just a, a, a small amount of data actually could be all we need to be able to make very prospective tests. Uh, and so, um, so I, my hope is that this would also enable collaborations. There are some limits that I think are worth uh, <coughs> mentioning. That uh, you know, one of the questions was, can one shot uh, generalize uh, to different scaffolds? And in this case, we're sort of taking uh, tasks learned for MUV and then applying it to CIDR. These are fairly different types of problems, and MUV is designed to be kind of uh, hard. Uh, and and so here, you know, it's not doing nearly as well. It's not doing poorly, but it's it's not doing nearly well as uh, compared to over random forests. And so there's still work to be done. It, it's still relatively early, but I think uh, it's something where having seen what we could do on the image side, building up architectures that sort of share the similar properties but are specialized for molecules, um, I think it's, uh, there's a lot of uh, potential for moving forward. Uh, so if you're curious to use this, this is something that's open source, it's in DeepChemIO. Um, if you're curious to sort of learn more about DeepChemIO, uh, you're in the right place. Uh, uh, Bart's gonna talk at 2, a, uh, 2 p.m. Uh, talking about uh, uh, how this works. And one of the things uh, I'd like to stress is that we'd love to have collaborators there. <coughs> okay, so what I will do is that I will skip uh, some of this stuff, and I think many of you have probably heard me talk about it before anyways. And I will just skip to the, uh, the, the conclusions. So um, it's an interesting time because when we think about where we are right now, I was thinking about putting this in, and I think I probably should have, is that I think everyone here is familiar with the Gartner hype cycle. You know, where, you st and the real question always is, where are we on the hype cycle? You know, the hype cycle, if those aren't familiar, it plots hype on the x-axis versus time on the y-axis, and the hype goes up, and then it crashes down, and then it gradually moves up. And so we always want to be like on the, like, oh, we've worked things out side of the hype cycle. Uh, and uh, the danger is that we're on the early part of the hype cycle. So if we think about machine learning broadly, machine learning has been hyped for such a long time. There's reason to hope that, you know, especially with Moore's Law and the things that are different now, and with so many people working on machine learning in different areas that we could be on the late side, there still is uh, the potential that this is uh, sort of in the DNN hype cycle that we're still very early. So you know, with that in mind, you know, it is still very early, but we are seeing, seeing signals that uh, these methods are superior to traditional M uh, ML. And when I see a DNNs, I think there's a whole space of methods that we could be talking about. We could be talking about Boltzmann and machines. I mean, we could be talking about things that are very complicated. And a lot of these methods are often not used because they are still very computationally demanding. You know, to, to be able to train a Boltzmann machine, which debatably is closer to the human brain than a DNN, especially in terms of the backpropagation that happens naturally, um, that's just something that requires, it can't be done with typical energy minimization methods, it has to be done with massive sampling. The cute thing from my perspective is that, you know, we like massive sampling. Uh, I would love to be running Boltzmann machines on folding at home, for example, um, if that's the right thing for us to do. So, so there's an opportunity there, but there's still, I think, a lot of room. Secondly, and this is something that I see both on the Stanford side of my career and also on the um, Andreessen Horowitz venture capital side of things, is that a lot of times right now, we've got very interesting data sets that are available and great ML code that's available, let's say, you know, Torch and, and, and TensorFlow and so on. But if you just take off the set data shelf uh, code and off the shelf, um, off the shelf data, off the shelf code, you're gonna get off the shelf results. And uh, not surprisingly. And so really what I think is gonna be important here is domain specific ML advances. And so in terms of what we, I, I just talked about here, I think uh, graph convolutions is a very appealing domain specific um, advance, but I think we need to do a lot more. And so I'm excited that uh, Adam Wise is here and a, 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 a co-organizer of this. I think uh, startups, academia, and, and, and pharma will be very critical. And actually that's my last point is that um, in, a, in order to make this happen, I think there's unique assets that exist in each one of these, uh, academia, startup, and pharma. And um, you know, academia debatably has more time to work on these problems and, and, and can and to go into crazy ideas. Uh, s startups have uh, a lot of motivation and, and, and drive to do things and, and maybe a smaller structure. And pharma has uh, huge data sets, people with huge amount of experience. And I think what's gonna be important is that 
we, we still have a ways to go to understand how well this can work and how we can make it better. And I don't see any way to do it any time soon without working very closely. In the talk here, I talked about how you know, we've worked with Google and with, with Pfizer and, and with Vertex, and people went back and forth. It's a model where I think um, if we could sort of all do that, we could move very quickly into the future. Okay, with that, I want to save some time for questions, and I think uh, there is hopefully about like 10 minutes or so for questions. Uh, let me just thank um, the people involved. So um, Evan and Amir, I don't know, I think Amir is here. Is, is Evan here? Uh, so they're uh, involved in a work on applying uh, machine learning to uh, molecular dynamics. And so if you're interested in, in sort of, um, uh, let's say in docking and especially docking into space where we can sort of, where there's flexible receptors, uh, I think there'd be natural people to talk to at the break. Um, so multi-test DNNs, I think Bart and, and uh, David are here and um, we could speak to that. Um, um, I think neither of them are here, but uh, I'd be happy to talk about our work with Vertex or work with Pfizer. And the one-shot stuff, it's very early, but I think uh, it has a lot of potential and I'm excited to see that move forward. So thank you very much. Talked about futurization, and I was curious what is the input of the, the, that graph. The yeah, it's a, it's it's a 2D fingerprint. Is ECFP. Okay. Yeah. Those 1,024 nodes. Yeah, that's the fingerprint. <coughs> yeah, I'm trying to think which graph you're thinking yeah, about here. The input layer, so yeah, I mean, so it is those 2D fingerprints. I mean, I don't know, Bart, if you have anything you want to add. Yeah, I think he, uh, would you want the one shot or do you want the, d the original multi-test DNN? Uh, this one. Yeah. This one is just ECFP4 fingerprints, so um, are we put any small fingerprints? Huh. Very standard stuff for visualization. Cool. Yeah. Uh, you might have mentioned that, Mr. Uh, to compare the result uh, on the CIDR data set versus the uh, TOX21 data set, it looks like in the TOX21 set, they clearly the convolutionally, uh, you know, graph and uh, speed learning perform much better. But on the CIDR data set, it looks like it's comparable to the random forest. I'm wondering whether you can comment on what's, uh, you know, what might be the reason. Yeah, I mean, I, I think here where we're training on CIDR and leaving out and then <coughs> Uh, and then testing on CIDR, we are definitely doing better. It's mainly when, so if you compare the, the table two oh, uh, there to there. Uh, so it's mainly where um, we're trying to now go training on, like training on MUV and going into CIDR. And uh, MUV is, I think, a challenging thing to train on just because of the nature of, of the way that was explicitly designed. Yeah. Uh, would you ever to dive into the like, abstract features you're learning in the yeah, this is very much something that I think is on our minds, and um, you know we've been wanting to 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 to, to do this. I think uh, let's see, you know, w you know, w one of the things that always comes up is you know, can we go beyond this as a black box? You know, can we can we learn from it? And you know, the fantasy is that we can get to something that thinks more like an organic chemist, and. Um, I think it is very early, you know, here for, 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 for this, uh, but that's something that is on our minds. Uh, what often happens is that you have to design networks that are intended to be interpretable, uh, that maybe have poor performance, but that um, are easy to pull things out from, and I think that could be the future of that. Um, also, in these cases, typically, I would want to have maybe much stricter regularization such that it's, we don't have some input uh, vector with like a million features that are important. We can pull out the three that have like 80% of the value rather than the 100 that have 99% of the value. And so I think th there's a lot of room for work here. Yeah. What's your perspective on um, why drug companies don't want to share data and is there potential for moving the field forward by uh, you know, machine learning on encrypted data or other ways of protecting aspects of the data that they do. Yeah, I think we all don't want to share data. I don't have my birthday and social security number up on the slides. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, uh, I don't know. If there are people from, <laughs> I don't know, uh, Jeff, if you want to add, add to that or. Yeah, sure. It's, I mean, the, the, the life of the industry, a big part of it is all about protecting intellectual property. Patent life is short. Um, companies start literally having to deal with uh, generic on slots years before the patent expires. So. Um, but in 
areas that are target agnostic, like <coughs> anti tox, there, there have been successful collaborations where we can share those data. They're not tied to a target. But we do it in a way where the, the chemical structures are kind of encrypted. Great. Yeah, question? Mm -hmm. Do you envision that the outcome of this kind of mathematics will be a predictive sort of design where you'll be able to suggest a structure based on the analysis such that it may be a, a potentially a more effective candidate? Oh, yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, you know, think about the, the, the pipeline that, you know, first we want to find leads and we want to optimize them and so on. I think in principle, this type of technology could be used very broadly. and in, in, in in our tests here, we're doing things with cross-validation, so they are uh, and uh, typically temporal cross-validation. So these are things that are intended to mimic the true perspective tests. But in you know, it, it, to be really bl blunt about, it, the only way to really know is true perspective tests, and that's the next step I think for these things. So do you think you need to add a lot more predictive parameters in order to come up with structures that are accessible? Uh, no, I think here we we just we screen queries through. So, so the queries could be could be zinc. It could be um, a won't kill, which is our um, or, or sweet lead, which is our repurposing database. It could be uh, any you know any one of a virtual set of, of things, and th that could be made or could be bought. The goal is to find a novel chemical entity that may outperform. Well, well, so the goal of technology is to be predictive. Um, how that technology is used could be manifold. So one could be an NCE, one could be repurposing. It's, it could be any one of those things. I think having the algorithm be able to predict another molecule to make just a slight improvement from the previous one, but it addresses key issues, yeah. that would be have a much bigger impact than finding something in zinc that you can buy. It could be a micromolar compound. Uh, you can still have a long way to go before you can optimize it into a drug candidate. Whereas you are working on an optimization program, you just need to find a couple of small improvements mm -hmm. to get you into a drug candidate. Mm -hmm. That could be a lot of value in that as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a fantastic point. Yeah, Jeff? So er earlier in your talk, you alluded to a big part of the challenge is finding the right descriptors mm -hmm. and that the people that do imaging don't really have, have to do that. It figures it out. Um, and then later you mentioned that I think the, the relatively poor performance in being able to extrapolate results outside of the training center. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that comes back to if you build the methods on connectivity indices, whether they're ECFP or whatever, their ability to recapitulate chemistry and predict it is pretty limited. Yeah. Those are all designed for finding molecules in databases, not for predicting mm -hmm. chemistry. Mm -hmm. But I think focusing on how do you find the descriptors that actually do a good job, in particular predicting non-bonded interactions, is probably the path we have to take. Yeah, I, I, that's a great point because these non-bonded things can be very complicated in space or especially with the receptor and so on. So I think they're interesting things to generalize both the fingerprints and also to include protein structures, receptor structures. Uh, I'll just mention in passing since I know uh, the, the, the work on the right, um, well, your, your right better, um, is that uh, uh, in this case we're using a, a sort of recursive-like method that can build features on top of features and, 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 and grow bigger and bigger structures. So there's the hope to incorporate that much better than a simpler fingerprint. And I think that's what makes these things fundamentally different than what you're describing. But it still doesn't expose, I think, as cleanly the, the higher order things that you're talking about. Um, and it's a funny thing. Uh, um, I was actually talking to uh, my older daughter, and she was asking about this machine learning stuff, and like, uh, why does representation matter? And I asked her to add like two, like four-digit numbers in her head, and she could do it very easily. And then I s wrote down the, those numbers in Roman numerals, and asked her to, to add them in her head. And obviously, you know, the, the representation is key for us to be able to understand things and do operations on them. And so I think we're going to still see issues here. We've been thinking a lot about three-dimensional representations as well. And I think it could be a fusion of the 2D and the 3D that was very, in very interesting. And so that's very much work under progress. Yeah. Just to continue on that thought about three representations, because the molecules have different conformations, and you really need to have, say, for instance, a shape, for instance, it could be one shape out of a set of hundreds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So comments about how we incorporate that into these methods? Yeah, and so, you know, there's uh, natural ways to do it in terms of just going through all the rotomers and so on, all, all, uh, and, and there, there's chemical ways of doing that. I mean, uh, 
I agree that's an outstanding problem. If you think about how people use something like rocks, they may use uh, uh, one structure, they may use multiple structures, and there's even debates about, about what to do there. I think those debates will, will continue here. Yeah. It would be ideal if the system could sort of start to understand this, and I don't think we have that right now, but I, I think that is very much in the pipeline. Okay, maybe one last question. Do you think you could use the physics-based simulations to help you get generative models for proposing models? Yeah, so that is very much on my mind, and I think we will start to see more of that. The physics-based simulations are still fairly expensive. We're getting to a point now where 100 microseconds is very straightforward. A millisecond is a lot of work, but doable. And so that's kind of where we are timescale-wise. Um, I would love that to be a thousand times longer, you know, for us to really be doing what you're talking about. But I think that there is very much a future there. When I think about these physical simulations, especially, uh, so what we're doing with force fields, and I didn't talk about it, that we use all this experimental data, and we've built, for instance, for water models, uh, what has been proven to be the best water model for the functional that, that people use. Uh, so that doesn't mean it's best possible, but for the functional people use it is the best model. And we're finally getting to that point where we can get the force fields to be uh, basically just constrained by experimental data. And so now what you think about, it, we have this pipeline where you have experimental data comes in to define force fields. Um, we run uh, simulation data, we build uh, features from that, and then we use other experimental data for docking and for binding and so on. And it becomes a, basically a framework where machine learning is in many different parts and that it's all leading to creating the best features to be able to expose the data that, and, and in the right representations that we've been talking about. Okay, good. So maybe that's a good place to end. We'll have plenty of time for discussion. I'll be here all day. So, uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>